Today's episode tackles the subject of addiction. If you're suffering from addiction, there are solutions available. We've compiled resources for you on our website, robinoshoes.com slash hope. This episode is presented by Robino Shoes and Demex Air. If you want to have a happy life with your wife and kid, then you have to be addicted to life. Life. You have to be addicted to the sea, to the, to, to the sand, to, 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 to the night you're going to go out with your wife and, you know, and, and then come back and then just watch a little TV, make love, you know, and then the next day go back and have a great day, you know. We want to welcome you back to Grain of Hope, a podcast where we talk to people all about sobriety. And today we're joined by somebody who not only do I know personally, but I really, really admire professionally. Um, he is literally the guy that has been there, done that, and bought the t-shirt. Uh, and that expression usually applies to people that have had a lot of life experience, that have had a lot of success, and um, that are that have survived to, like, to, to reap the rewards. And um, what I like about our guest today is that um, growing up as a Montreal musician, you had, you know, a few people that you really, really respected if you were in the rock scene. Um, and, and one of them was Rick. Rick is an incredible vocalist. Um, he's played with absolutely everyone under the sun. Um, and he played with them when they were good, <laughs> which, which is cool because he was there. He was there on, on, on the ground floor for, for a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, the stuff that happened in rock and roll. And I, he's also someone that's benefited from not only staying sober, but having a resurgence in his career. Mm. And, uh, but today we're going to talk to him about sobriety. So we're joined by Rick Hughes, uh, the vocalist of S.W.O.R.D. I'm very, very happy to, that, you're, that you're here with us, man. Thank you, brother. You know, I love you. Yeah, me too. I love you very much. And, and, and what's great is that when Angelo and I were, were talking, we we're like, you know, who should we have on, on the English podcast? Mm. You know, you said, like, you know, um, someone had suggested Rick Hughes. And I'm like, I know Rick. I can reach out to Rick. Yeah. But, if, you know, but a lot of people speak to Rick in French. But That's a lot right. of people don't realize Rick's fully bilingual. And Rick is super, super known internationally f- for his music. And he sings in English. So I think the opportunity to have him on the English podcast is, is pretty cool. Yeah, and but, besides the fact that you just did a podcast in French about recovery. <laughs> oh, really? So, okay. So okay. Yeah. I was like, this time we'll talk in English and perhaps later on we'll do one in French. But let's really, because you have a hell of a resume and we didn't really talk about those bands that you played with, but Bon Jovi, Mo- Motorhead and Metallica. It's pretty crazy. I'd like to dive into your recovery path and I know it's something that's really important to you. And I, and I listened to your last podcast in French. And I know that you have 20 plus years of recovery. And it still feels like you're extremely passionate about recovery. Why? To me, recovery is a, is a day-to-day thing. You know, it's not a year-to-year or a, how many years you have being sober or, or what path you took. You know, it's very personal and and. For me, the AA program helped me so much, you know, because before I really dived into the AA program, I was, uh, I was on a self-destructive path and I did not know it because it was the only path I knew. And that destructive path or, or the saboteur, you know, yeah. is it, always there. He's always there, even after 20 years of sobriety, you know. And in, in, in a way, I feel lucky to, uh, to, uh, to be an alcoholic mm. because it opens the door to A, you know. That, it means this is my crowd. This is my gang. This is the, so recovery, if you're a member, is... It's something to, beautiful. For me, it's, it's going to be all my life, you know. Sometimes I haven't done a meeting like in a couple of weeks even months and, and, and then poof, it, it appears, you know, in my head, it goes, Oh, I mean, I need to do a meeting right now, you know, because uh, something's not right. I don't feel as, as uh, mellow, as smooth as I, as, as I supposed to, you know, I'm, I'm more into fears. I'm more into, into the obscure part of Rick, you know? So once I go to the meeting, then it's she balances. like, like mm. yeah, like like most of, of us know, it's it's usually 
don't ask me why, in the basement of a church, you know? So it brings you back to church. So what, what, I go to, my, to the meetings around my house and uh, I live uh, in St. Celia. And that's what it does, man. It, it, it brings me to church. I, once I, I, I just arrive, I park my car and I see people waiting for me uh, at like, hey, you know, and, and then I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm home, you know. It's funny, you know, um, you're saying, you know, I, I'm almost fortunate that I, I found the program. I feel lucky to have, I luck, feel lucky to be an alcoholic. I feel the same way because I not only dealt with my disease, but I have a program for living now. And I feel like I have all the tools that I need to build a life and I have all the tools I need to maintain. And that's the thing. When you have that, it's such a, 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 a bonus that people don't understand. Like people go, oh, it's sad being alcoholic. I feel so bad for you. It's like, are you kidding me? This is the one disease that I'm happy I have. Yeah. And I never th you think you like, I'm happy that I have this disease. I'm grateful that I have this disease because it brought me a way of life and it brought me a whole, whole different outlook on everything. It changed everything for me. So it's funny you say that you almost feel lucky because it's, it's a really positive way to look at it. And I think people that have good sobriety realize that, right? right. You know, for sure. What's the, so you spoke about the importance of the fellowship. You spoke about AA, but what was the pivotal point? What was that turning point in your life that said, I need to bring my ass to a meeting? Cause I assume that you were on destructive path, but what changed Love, man, love. It's love that, 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 that brings you home, that, that makes you realize that, that, that you're destroying the people that love you, you know, because you, once you become an addict, let's, let's take a gambler. The gambler, we are, we're, our souls are more unique than our DNA. Because let's say you're a twin and, and you're a perfect twin or en français, identical. identical. Yeah. yeah. You have the same DNA, but you don't have the same soul. No. Your soul is <clears throat> unique. That's, that's the, your uniqueness is in your soul. So take the gambler. One season, this is disease, you know, he's like all the other gamblers. He, he's not, he's not, his soul is like buried and, and this, it's the addict that take controls. So you lose your identity. Yeah, you do. Any, yes. What happened from your first parties with friends until the moment you said, okay, I'm really on the wrong path and I need help. What's your process? Depression. I was, I was in deep, deep, deep depression. It's, it's, everybody's got a story to tell. You know, we all have our path to destruction or to recovery. You know, mine is weird because it's like, um, It's like sections, you know, like the, when I did Route 66, you only do sections of the route. And, and then, then you, go, you go on the highway and you fly to the next zone. And, and then, well, a little part of Route 66. When I was, I started to drink, I was 14 years old. You know why? Because it was everywhere. It was in, our, in, our, in, in, in somebody's cabinet. We had a new friend. We'd go into his house. And then I, my dad's got alcohol. <laughs> Let's try it, you know? So... Right there, some, we're, we're talking the 70s, it, it was starting to, to, be, to be well known in the A's here in Quebec in the 70s. Right there, there's some people that would tell me, hey, one day you're going to need AA. I remember <laughs> saying, what? Isn't that a cult? You know? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> But why were they saying that? Like already at 14, your using was different than like a social it using? It was excessive. Yes. because. Already? Okay. Let's just take, you know, Jason, what I'm going what I'm gonna say right now, when I, I tell people and, I, and I, I'm a recovering alcoholic and they go, oh yeah, you're a rock and roll singer, you know, uh, the music industry, you know, is, 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 is well known for that. I go, no, 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 I, I don't that. agree with you at all. <laughs> yeah. I know much more people that don't have any problem with alcohol or drugs that are into the music business than the other way around. Yeah. You know, well, we have two right here that are in the rock and roll scene or that were active that don't use and you both are vocalists you both are singers yeah and i think that being a singer really uh, uh sort of controlled your 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 drinking it did 
So, so once I discovered music, you know, when, when I was 14, I started to drink and, and, and it became a problem fast. Like I, at 16, I was throwing up, you know, and when yeah. you, once you start to throw up, that's when you, yeah. your body <laughs> says, okay, Enough. stop it, you know? <laughs> so anyways, I, it's funny, I should say the word throw up on a Sunday, you know, I'm just kidding. But then I, then I discovered music. Then I stopped drinking, man, because mm. music would, would, would touch passion. my soul. I, 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 I came alive, you know, so, so I partied with friends, you know, and, but it was under control. And then I, like you said before, I toured with Metallica. So, so then I was achieving stuff, you know, so I didn't, I didn't need anything to, 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 to numb yourself or to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then, and then it kept on and on and on. And then the nineties arrived and, and, and. And, and God decided to put an end to my career and say, now you need to put the man into the man, you know, because I was partying, I was starting to, to you know, to have some bad habit because of, of my way of life. So that happened to me. So I had to quit music and go to work. So that's what I did in the nineties. I went to work and, and that I did not know at the time made me go into a depression because I, I was, I guess, born to, to make music, you know? We all have our calling, that's mine. So, so it's not when I was into my career that the problem was very, very bad. It's, it's when I was not. It was more after. Yeah, it's, it's an, it, this, all the in-betweens, that's when I took the drop. And yeah. that, you know, and a lot of people that, um, that do do music or any kind of art will tell you that, that if, you're, if you're someone that is in your art and you're in your process and you're working, you're okay. But there's it's when you stop. There's discipline, there's a, yeah, there's a, certain there's amount a of framework it. that right. you can fit in, you need to... Yeah, like you have um you need to perform yeah people expect you to perform you every dates, night so you have to do something a show you get ready you for it, it so you, know? you played it in front of you I said it it's a live performance mm -hmm. usually for an artist that that that's where you get your you get your drug you yeah. know yeah and it is a lot of dopamine you know, for you sure you know in french on dit un homme un homme s'accomplit dans son travail un homme um, s'identifie à son travail. Mm -hmm. fait, so, so if one day to the other you lose your job, you, you, you lose the, your, your identity, if you have a tendency to go towards something like alcohol, then you go to, towards it and, and that's when it started to, to go real bad for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why Jacques Claude was staring at me, but I had a, a shift in my life sort of career. And yeah, we do identify uh, to certain things. And once you, you lose that identity, uh, I feel like alcohol, drugs can be a quick fix. Like it could be something that fill that emptiness. I, I, and I, I get it too. You know what I mean? It's, it's an easy year. path. Rough year for me too. It was a rough year, right? Oh, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I lost my job in June. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I went from one day to the next being on air for 14 years to not. And you know what? If I didn't have my program, and if I didn't have my design for living and I didn't have my support, who knows what would happen? You know, Agreed. so it's, you Agreed. need that. It, this is, is going to keep you balanced. It's, it's it, like I said earlier, you know, we, I, we feel lucky at times to have, to have the program because we all know about uh, les étapes, you know, but um, les, les traditions, you know, the, that we don't read the 12th uh, uh, étape. don't talk about the 12 traditions as much. Les, les 12 promesses. Ah, each meeting for nothing because we need to be reminded that there is hope. There's always it's hope. It's going to be know? okay. Just stay yourself. Be that's yourself. The, uh, that's the name of our podcast. <laughs> yes. Reign of hope. So there, there is hope. There you go. No matter where you are. But you come from, because you spoke about your background before. You said your mom was Italian. Yeah. And your dad Irish. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you lost your dad. He was only 29 years old. Yeah. Eight years old. So for sure, I mean you sort of became the boss of your life at an early stage. And uh, I, I guess you've made certain decisions. And can you run us through your, your, your youth and, and tell us how it was growing up from going to, you know, living in Montreal to touring with all these, these, uh, these bands? Because that must be like a hell of a like dopamine shot. Like you, you go from being unknown to being touring, playing in front of 50,000 people, like 
that's a drug in itself. I mean, like. Life has a funny way. <laughs> yeah, that's a line from a song. <laughs> yeah. Life has a funny way. You know, when I was a kid and I lost my dad, it, it, in my head, he was a hero, you know, because my dad played guitar. My mom sang in a band, in his band, so they would rehearse in the basement. So, like, um, Obelix and Asterix, I, I fell you into it when I was a it. kid, yeah, man. Yeah. Came by it honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and when I felt really, really, really alone, it it was always music that would that would bring me up, you know? So so I I would think about my dad if he would be alive, and I'd I'd say, okay, so if he, he if he'd be alive and his career would have continued. And and then I, I, maybe it would be like opening for uh, Elvis in Vegas or uh, I don't know any, anything like yeah. anything big you know so I would visualize that I would visualize that and I believe in in that you know that if you visualize something that's going to happen in the future it will happen if yeah. you v visualize sobriety then then it probably will happen because then you'll visualize that you have to go to meetings and uh, so. So I kind of did that, and by the age of 22, I had a record deal. So the record deal took me to places where, where I never, no, I, that I dreamt all my life that I, would, that, that I would go, and I was there. So I would, I had my big brother in my band, Dan, I still have. Your drummer, right? Yeah, and, and the band that, that Jason was talking about, Sword, where, where a, a metal band, my brother's the drummer. So I would I would just go like this to my brother when would look at the crowd, you know, we're in Chicago, let's say, and they were going sword, sword, sword. I would go, check down. We made it. Check down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So from being like nobody to getting a record deal at 22, opening for these incredible bands. But how did how did that happen? By the grace of God. And by the grace of God. I mean, I feel so lucky to have to have went to have live that you know i feel so lucky to 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 have become an alcoholic and be the man that i am today you know just because i i went through that disease and and now i'm in the process of of of, of always getting better and better and better you know and and i say that in, in the most humble way that possible you know better mean better to me to myself you know not to other you know right I, but it's the first thing that when i met you this morning you're such an hum like a humble man. And I've, I've never met you. I mean, I, I don't see a lot of rock star celebrities, or, but you're such a humble man. I mean, that's, your, that's because of your, your, uh, the recovery? That's because of AA that you're, you feel you're this way? Or? Well, thank you so much for the, this awful, it's awful for, for this great compliment. <laughs> no, I was going to say, no, it's my Italian mom with the slap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you and I, when I, I was not being almost, I was like, tish. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the thing with Rick is that um, we, all, you, you know, he doesn't have much of an ego. You know, like you, you have an ego. Like that, I think you have the ego that you need to have to do what you do. But you've always been really kind. And um, but it's funny because it's you know, if you know if you're if you're a metal fan or if you're a rock fan, um, you got to play with you know, like you you played. If I'm not mistaken, you played on the on the Master of Puppets tour, right? Yes. I mean. Master of Puppets, when you talk about Metallica, are you, are you a Metallica fan? No, not really. But you know Metallica. You know, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Master of Puppets is like, for Metallica fans, is pretty much the record. Like, it's the record. Like, there's Kill Em All, there's Ride the Lightning, but Master of Puppets is the record. And Cliff Burton was one of the most incredible bass players in the world. You got to tour with that band during that era. You got to see Cliff Burton play. Well, how the hell did, you, did, did like, they find you to open for them? I, I, I want to know that story. Like, how <laughs> did you get on, and uh, how did you get to play with them during Master of Puppets? And what was it like to watch Cliff Burton play? And I know this is a little off topic, but Cliff Burton, <laughs> one of the greatest Yo, bass I'm players. I'm interested. I want to know what it was like to watch him play and how you got on that. Well, okay, I'm going to make a long story short. No, make it Listen long. Listen to this. <laughs> I want to know. It's, 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 <laughs> en, en, en français, on dit le plan divin. There was a, a divine intervention plan. I don't know what happened right. there. We, we were um, we were a sword, you know, well known in Quebec. We were like, uh, every day, everywhere we'd go, we'd paint the town red, you know. So, and we would ride in the car, the four of us, and we'd listen to Master of Puppet in a cassette. Next side, <laughs> next side, next side. I listen to it 
day, every, every day. So phone rings, uh, we're at home rehearsing, and it's our, the, our manager, and he says, hey, Rick, are you sitting down? I said, why? He says, because you're going to need to sit down on this one. I said, why? <laughs> he says, I just got a call from Metallica's manager. They're touring right now, and they're listening to your album oh. from side to side. It's been days now. They've been listening. Like they were doing what we were doing, we were doing but yeah. with, with our album, which it's called Metal Eyes, you know, yeah, the first sort of album. I have it on vinyl. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they ask us to join them on tour. So we go, okay, perfect. So the, the tour starts here in, uh, in Verdun, in Montreal. I had the de Verdun at that time. It was in the Old Forum de Morale. It's the year after they were. So they announce the show. It's on TV. Everybody's talking to us. Sword's going to open to, for Metallica. Man, man, man. And then we get a phone call. Uh, um, James Edfield had broken his arm, his arm doing skateboard. Remember that? He broke his arm. So they had to cancel the tour. So, so they stopped the advertisement on TV and they say, okay, <laughs> round two. So uh, Metallica is going to come, but that date, because this day, nah, nah, nah. so it was postponed for two months. So we go. Okay, so let's go back to the rehearsal hall. So we went to rehearsal. The date was announced on TV, and then we get a phone call. So I never got to play with him because the second phone call was to announce that, that Cliff had just died. Oh, so you didn't get to play with them? No. So, so, so listen to this. So I'm sorry to yeah, no, no, it's okay. antag antagonize. It's okay. I was going to say, so, so the second phone call tells us that he died during the, the tour. So the, the tour was postponed for another two months. Right. So two months. Wow, that's a lot. No, no, it was not a lot at all. Because I'm going to end the story like that. When I got to meet Metallica, they were a fan of our album and we were a fan of the band. So, so there was a connection right away. So, so we do our first show with them. And then they say, okay, the guys want to meet you. And we met them before, but now that the show was over, they want to meet you in their dressing room. So they're ready. Are you, are you ready? So, of course. So we got our stuff together and we went into Metallica's dressing room and, and we were sitting and we we're like this and we were talking and James was right there where you are. And he was fixing like this. He just lost his friend two months before from a car, a a, a, a bus accident. A bus accident. And, uh, yeah. Everybody was okay. Not a single scratch. He died because he went out of the window and the bus fell on him. And, and you know the story. Yeah. That he that uh, Lars had switched bunks with him. It's it, it's it's so crazy. It's, it's awesome. But but my point is is that th these guys were shocked, man. They were like this. So be careful. James would go like this, so be careful on the road. It's because I didn't want to talk about that, you know. I, I wasn't, but they did. He said, it's very, very dangerous on the road. And it was just thick. It was staring to oblivion, you know. And I was looking at him. And even back then, I had some spirituality in me because of my Italian mom <laughs> that would go like this. Sometimes she would sit me down and she would talk to me like an angel, you know. So I would listen to him and I would feel his pain. And later on... I kept telling myself, these guys should have stopped like a year or something like yeah. that. You mean record companies are mean. I mean? We need to sell the album. Come on, let's go and keep on the road now. That's my personal opinion. So if, there was a huge watching, trauma. Like they, they just lost their best friend, their yeah. bandmate, and they, get, they have to keep on working. They had to keep working. So if they're watching, guys, I love you. I, I don't mean that wow. in an <laughs> irrespectful way at all. It's the other way around. You know, I respect them a lot. You weren't yeah. in recovery yet at that time. No. Okay. I, and I wasn't, I wasn't, the, 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 the disease mm -hmm. had no control on me at that time at all, at all. Because your passion was taking all the room. In a rock available. band, there's only two members that cannot be uh, doing a, a shot eye. The drummer and the singer. Because take the guitar player or the bass player of a rock band with shut eye, you know, and, and doing all the stuff, you know. The next day, they'll be on stage, uh, they'll see like butterflies and everything. But it's not going to show. But the singer, if he, if he had... 
You forget your he's words. He's going to do two songs. His voice is going to go. go. He's going to go. He's going to fall off stage. He's going to black out. And the sing. drummer is going to do two songs. Mm. And he's going to be finished because mm. he didn't sleep all night. So you, know? you and your brother, yeah. I guess during that time, since you're the singer, he's the drummer, you're playing in front of all these like crowds, it kept you on track. Yeah. Then in the 90s, the rock music sort of like dies out. I think it was more like the well. I think what happened in grunge. the '90s for a lot of a lot of bands that were playing that style of metal when grunge came in, it's it like took the, all the oxygen out of the room. <laughs> it's like the it's like and you and a lot of bands that were in the '80s will say that story. You know, like the Guns N' Roses say the story of how when they went into their label, they saw the Alice in Chains posters on the wall, and they were like, "We knew it was up." Like it was done. Like in so many bands that happened to, you know, like, uh, yeah. it was just, the, the, you know, that. So what happens to your disease then? Because you said the disease is sleeping. You're, you're in control. Then everything stops in the nineties. What the hell happened to the disease? Then it, it gradually took over me. So, so Rick was out. It was another Rick that appeared. <laughs> the bad Rick. The you one went to work in what field, uh, uh, construction, uh, mainly physical stuff. I tried some, uh, some, some telemarketing, you know, I tried to be a, an office kind of guy, yeah. but the uh, only thing uh, that was, uh, that was office about me was, uh, was, was my square head. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it's hard for guys yeah. like us <laughs> that come from that to transition into mm. anything else. It's oh, really just to have a normal, uh, it's hard eight to, find, to five, uh, it's hard to find yeah. your place when you're a musician and you're a touring musician and you go and you try to find a place in the regular world, because the reality is most of us spent our twenties touring. We didn't go to school. We didn't get, for, I don't know about you, but I, yeah. no, no real formal education after high school. You know, a couple of years, CJEP years, but I wasn't educated. I was educated in life. Like I would always tell people, they go, where'd you go to school? I went to the school of hard knocks and I have a degree, but it serves me in other ways. But it's a scary thing when you're in that thing. Like if I don't play music, I'm a loser. So it's almost like we make ourselves go into, into fields that aren't too ambitious. It's like, well, I'll just do this because it'll be easy if I get a call to play because I can take a day off from this job. <laughs> they won't care. Or, you know, but if I get into something that's too committed, then I'm really giving up my dream. I had that problem. It was the biggest problem for me that I was, um, and it's almost like in sobriety, I realized that's not who I am. I'm me like, and I can be me wherever I go. And that was the best feeling when I could let that go and realize, hey, I can do a lot of other things besides sing, you know? And it's scary for some people that, that, that do that. And they can't see past that. You say you, you're born to do music. Um, what brought you back to music after doing that? Sobriety. Yeah, sobriety. Because um, I remember um, the worst f was from 2000, 1992 to 2002. Ten years. I went like this. 2002, I was ready to die. I was ready to leave this hurt. Because Rick had no longer existed anyways, you know. But... Um, and, and then, and then, and then I took, you know, control of myself. I went to, to, um, um, I went to, um, a therapy, yeah, yeah, a treatment center. And then uh, from 2003, I, 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 I became sober and I, and I had some offers, you know, to go do this or do that. And I would refuse them I, for, for at least the two first year of my true sobriety, I would just stay, uh, construction construction work, raise my kid, you know, stay away from bars, stay away from situation that would, and then after three years, I started to accept again to go sing here and there for. Well, like, let's say bands, uh, let's say uh, bars, uh, play tours. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't do bars. If I do bar, I would go with my girlfriend and I, I would, I would be a, an invited guest just to sing a couple of songs. So I would arrive for the sound check, leave, go have a bite, come back for the show. And when I would done, I would leave, you know, because like I said earlier, you know, it, these were big events. So, so there's a lot of people that are, that are consuming a lot of alcohol, a lot of drugs, and they don't all have the same problem as I have, you know? Most of these people have it on, under control, so, you know? So, so you needed to protect yourself. Yes, I needed to do that. So, Especially at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Be, and I, I didn't want to feel rejection, 
or, or, or try something that didn't work, you know, because there, you get a lot of that when, when you're a singer or, or you want to start something artistically, you know. There's a lot of critics, so if you're not right on to it, you know, if something's wrong with, with your art and it, it gets, you know, labeled as not good, but for an alcoholic that's recovering, you know, that's like just starting to recover. Yeah. It, it could be, it so could, he, be, it could hard. be, it could be a, a, a relapser. Yeah. yeah you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you, you can feel that. Exactly. Know, dangerous. And what about your anonymity? Like la, l'anonymat, anonymity. When you started, were you very open about it or was it very something personal at first? Uh, um, a little bit of both. I needed, I needed both because, um, I, I, I realized that at some places when I would announce it, I, would pre I was protecting myself because, yeah, because people, if I would say, hey, by the way, I, I don't drink. Uh, Rick, you, you never, like, I would work on construction. We'd all stop at, the, at that time at, at the brasserie here and there, pubs, you know, and I would, I would order a seven up a Coke. Or, you never take alcohol. No, no, I don't. I'm three years sober. I'd find out that I would pr that would protect me because the next time I would go, you know, then... They wouldn't offer you a bottle of Jack or something like that. Or if I would, <laughs> they would go, aren't you supposed to be yeah. sober? Yeah. You know, and, and, and that... Yeah, the word is out. Yeah, it, at, at one time or the, or the other, it, become your ba it becomes your badge of honor. You know, I wear it on my neck. You know, I got the, the sobriety prayer right here, you know. So um, I got it all. I, I wear it even when I sleep all the time. So to me, it's a badge of honor. For, so yes, l'anonymo, it's very important. Other people's anonymo. I will I never, say. never, never, never mention anybody that I met in a meeting or, or I know is, uh, to somebody else and say, oh, by the way, he's, no, 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 I would never do that. But I don't mind if people do it for me. If they go, you should, you like Rick, you like the way he sing, you like the way he writes? Yeah, well, he's, he's a AA member, he goes there. I don't mind if they yeah, do the it, you know? That's why, yeah, some public figure as Jason and I are open about it. It's just... It might help somebody else. 100%. Yes. 100%. But there's a big difference between anonymity and confidentiality. Yeah. It's two different things. Well, like I don't that. know if we've talked about this on the podcast before, but the the because the, the, the story, like, you know, when, I, when AA started, um, the whole reason why they had that anonymity in there is because when they started, they didn't have the infrastructure to take on all the requests they were getting. So once they had that article that was that was published in the, in the, and the Saturday evening poster, there was this article that was published on Alcoholics Anonymous. And when that article was published, I think it was in the forties or the late thirties, forties, there was an interest that blew up. So they were like, we need to have anonymity because we can't handle the influx. The structure now is there. So the anonymity, the anonymity, and yes, you said is exactly. And I think it's how we all are. I'll guard your anonymity with my life. But I choose to live out loud because I know I've helped people. I know, I know for a fact I've helped people because someone will say, like you said, if you like what Jason's doing, you're like, call him. And I've just today, right before coming here, I got a message from someone. Hey, I'm looking for a rehab in Montreal. This girl has problems. She called me. She messaged me, let me all this, you know, the whole big thing. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm lost. I'm like, hey, we'll figure it out. We'll find you something. You know, we'll find you some direction to go in. But if I wasn't living out loud, where would that be? You know, so it's important when we, we, we tow that anonymity line Carefully, you know, it's a, it's a weird one. Because if we kept everything to ourselves and didn't talk about it, how do we help anybody, you know? I literally had a, a, a girlfriend say to her boyfriend while we were doing shows uh, in like uh, Mexico or I remember or, or if it was Jamaica, Jamaica, something like that, go to, you think Rick's cool, huh? Well, Rick He's doesn't sober. drink. Do like him. Because like, <laughs> I, you know, I took the include that guy yeah, was yeah. there. Well, oh, yeah. Man, <laughs> Dude, that's day. cool. If you could stay sober mm -hmm. and an all-inclusive. Done it many times. Yeah. You're the coolest one in the... <laughs> I agree. Yeah. man, the next day you're up at seven, the sunrise, <laughs> and everybody else is in their room. Uh, when I was in Mexico for the destination wedding, I was there with like 40 people that were all partiers. And I was the guy, like you, like we've talked about yeah. this, I was the guy that got up at... 5.30, went and worked out and was out on the beach watching the sunset at, or sunrise at 6.02. And it was the best feeling in the world. <laughs> you the don't best. need alcohol to have fun in an no. all-inclusive. No. And that's like the biggest lie. There's so many lies. You know about, why? Yeah. Because you have to, if, if, 
If you want to have a happy life with your wife and kid, then you have to be addicted to life. Life. So if you're tout inclus, you have to be addicted to the sea, to the, to, to the sand, to, 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 to the night you're going to go out with your wife and, you know, and, and then come back and then just watch a little TV, make love, you know, and then the next day <laughs> go back and have a great day, you know, that's you being to, addicted to smoked life. Salmon. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> if you're addicted to alcohol, then forget about no, it. It's no, over. So you've been maintaining sobriety for 20 plus years, yeah. which is a great achievement. What are your strategies or what really helps you to stay on that path? What are the most, let's say, the top three things that are the most important? For a beginner or for me? For Rick. Okay, thank you. Il y a une phrase en anglais qui dit, en français, qui dit, um, si t'es pas bien à la maison, t'es pas bien nulle part. So, so, so if, you're not, if, you're not, if you're not comfortable at, at home, home, then you're not comfortable anywhere. If you're not, exactly. So... So to me, it starts at home. First things first, home. You know. So what, what, it, what I mean by that is that uh, um, my my income tax got to be done. You know, my my sock drawer, my sock drawers got to be okay. You know, <laughs> and, and I should have started with the first. Uh, my wife's got to be happy. You know, and so so how do I make my wife happy by by being in, connected to her and to her needs because she's connected to my needs. That's for sure. You know, so that's number one. I have to to make sure that that home is where the love is, is where, you know, it's all starts from home. And and once that's done, then then it's the it's it's the, it's it's my surroundings. I have to make sure that that my surroundings are are people that 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 don't abuse or substances or substances so so by doing that then then I go to meetings because like everybody else I need to have a social life so where do I find my social social life with my friends my family and the AA um, movement That's number two, and you said, yeah, there was three, yeah. The, the third one is would be, uh, would be, would be, to to, I, I guess, uh, prayers and meditation, because that's where you calm yourself. That's where you you make plans. That that where you you, you know, ten. Uh, 20 people can tell me, don't worry about it, Rick. Everything's gonna be okay. Don't worry. 20 people. But if I don't say that to myself, the 20 people don't, don't mean nothing. So nothing. I, I assume like spirituality is really important to you. You showed us your cross. You have your uh, serenity prayer. Can you explain to us like the importance of spirituality in this process of recovery? Yes. To me, spirituality is, is, is a word that, that has... For a lot of people, one meaning, but for me, it has a thousand meaning. And and one of them would be um, uh, rigoureuse honnêteté. How do you how do you trans? Honesty. Okay, honesty. That's number one in my list for for being spiritually healthy. It's your honesty. It's a spiritual principle. Yes, mm -hmm. that's to me. That's up there. So, what does that do to me? Well, if I'm rigorously honest, then if I, I've, I make a faux pas towards my wife, most important person in my life, if I make a faux pas, then I will realize it fast if I'm rigorously honest. If I'm honest, sometimes it's going to take out <laughs> yeah. some time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. So it, it, I'm not saying that I am. I'm saying that I wish to be rigorously honest all the time so it it, it brings that it brings um it brings a lot of uh, forgiveness when you're, you're rigorously honest forgive everybody around you because you because if somebody you think has done you harm in in a way if you're honest about it you're gonna say to yourself why would he take me personally it's mm. because he's feeling bad it's not because of me yeah it's because of so i'm going to give him more love you know so spirituality is is all about love you know it it sounds a bit cliche but and i love that i love that you use the word love but is it 
really the love for yourself or like within? Because we say often like you got to love others and you got to be there. You got to be there for your family. But I feel like you have to find a way to really, truly love yourself. Thank Take you. care of who you are, right? Thank you. Amen. Self-love. That's what I meant. Exactly. Self-love. It starts at home. When I said, si t'es pas bien à la maison, t'es pas bien nulle part. If si t'es pas bien à la maison. But since you're a very big your AA body, guy, uh, huh? Go. since you're a big AA guy, you know those three principles, um, clean house, trust God, help others. I don't know if that's the order, but I feel like clean house is what you mean. Like I love it. Clean, clean your inside. You, that uh, inventory that we do uh, on a daily basis, uh, trusting God, trusting that there's a higher power that's there to support and helping others. And w what does it mean to you to help others? Is it like you come and help me? I got to put this frame up and we put a, a, a nail to the wall. What, what does it mean to you? It's natural. To me, the, the helping others it, it is natural. I'm, I, I got so much love to give. And I know I do. I know. Um, I could feel it, by the way. I don't know if you could, you guys could oh, yeah, feel no, it. Oh, yeah, I I mean, listen, I... <laughs> I, I know him. <laughs> like, you know... Um, Can we adopt you like a, <laughs> <laughs> like a spiritual... No, but, like, no, but, but, but honestly, like, like that's, that's the thing with Rick. Like, Rick's got a great vibe about him, you know? Yeah. Um, and we've had, we've had quite a few time, chances over the last few years to, to get to know each other a bit better every time. But every time I'm with him, I'm like, oh, man, I, want, I wish I could hang out with Rick a little bit more, a little bit more, because he's got great energy, you know? And, um, and I think, you know... That's one of the reasons why when you see, and we haven't really talked about it, but there's been like this resurgence for your band over the last few years. Um, you know, you put out a new record, you guys are starting, you know, you started playing a little bit more. People are like, it's, it's great to see these fans showing up and being like, man, like, you know, we, we remember this band. We, and, and, and then younger kids are coming and it's, and I think a lot of it has to do with the, the, the fact that you are doing all the right things for you. Because when you do those things, um, you get good back and, and it's because you're doing it for the right reasons. You know, like when you do something for the right reasons and you're keeping your side of the street clean, I believe all the good things come to you. It's you putting that good energy out there and good energy comes back. So, um, it, it's great to see someone like Rick have success because you want, you want him to have success. You want, you know, like people are like, want to cheer for you. Um, I want to just touch on this really quickly because you take your time. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> take your time, bro. <laughs> Before Sword had a resurgence, you did a lot of singing, like in in, in other bands. But like, tell tell some people, like tell some of the people, because I know on the French side, a lot of people know who you are. But maybe on the English podcast, there's going to be people internationally that might not know what you do besides Sword. But some of the other artists that you performed with, um, let people know because you perform with some heavy hitters. Yeah, in a well, lot of different scenarios. True. So when I was talking about the 90s that I, that I found a job to, uh, en français, uh, uh, mettre l'homme dans l'homme, mettre de l'homme dans l'homme, I, I was still singing. I was, I was 10 years uh, chorus on, t on a TV show. Uh, I sang chorus for a lot of big acts. So, so I was behind the scene, you know. Yeah. There was a, the, the light was on somebody else. Me, I was just helping his voice by by lending mine to his. Yeah. So I did that for at least 20 years. That's also humbling, I would assume. Yes, yes, it is. Especially when you're doing a TV show and, and every time that, that a singer comes by, he passes in front of you and he goes takes the center stage and you do that for 10 <laughs> years. You know what, you know something? One of my dreams as a singer is to be, is to one day sing in a band like a big blues or a, like a big blues band or a big funk band and to be on the back line with two other singers. That's one of my dreams is just to be able to sit there and just like do the moves and do, so was that cool to do that? There must've been a fun, a, something about it that was fun too, or no? Yes, <laughs> okay. oh yes, oh yeah. Oh no, no, I find joy in, in yeah. everything. I, I believe in God, I, I really do. Yeah. When I was coming here today, you know, I knew that I would have to translate my, my, my partage, my, yeah. my kind of songs from French to English. And thank you for uh, giving me some, um, Positive energy when you said I was perfectly bilingual <laughs> because of course people can see that I'm not, <laughs> Dude, but I'm trying. I did, I did the podcast the first time we met. <laughs> we I did the did podcast the French in French. French. Yeah. Yeah. And listen, you're I was, good man in French. Oh, well, listen, I, you know, if, if I could have said how many times I said "situ situ," I think my wife counted it and it was like 112. <laughs> so you'll never do that again, <laughs> no, because your wife counted it. 
<laughs> but I, I was saying my favorite prayer that I invented, but it's not a big invention. I mean, probably somebody did it too before me, but I invented a prayer for myself and it, it, it's, Merci Dieu de guider mes pas et mes pensées. So I don't ask for nothing. I just say thank you because you're guiding me towards where I'm going this morning and what, what is going to come out is, is I don't have any, you know, it's God's word that, that comes through me because we're, we're talking here about this conversation we're having right now is life saving. Yeah. We know it. It is. Yeah. For There's, us and for someone. Yeah. I believe for that. somebody that's listening mm -hmm. right now because yeah. we're doing okay. Mm -hmm. We're fine, you know? So we're trying with this circle of friends. We're, we're talking about a disease that somebody's going to go, Rick, Rick's cool. Jason's cool. Man, okay, I want that too, you know? So that's why we're doing Definitely it. Definitely, I want something that you have. And I could tell this like straight up, that energy that you have, that serenity, I feel like we see in certain people that have, but it just takes time, right? I don't think it comes in a year, two year, five year. It might take for some 10, 15, 20, 30 years to have that serenity, to have that trust that there's a plan just to follow, to keep on following trust the path. Trust the process. Just to trust the process. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what's mm -hmm. incredible. And you know, um, you're talking about life-saving conversations. I mean, I don't know how many times you'll text me and go, dude, look at this message I got. And it's a screenshot of someone saying, I was having a hard time and I listen to this podcast every day on my way to work and it helps me and you guys help me. And you know, the fact that we're doing this in English based on the success of the one in French, I mean, it's great. And, and you know, it would be awesome to see this concept happen in Spanish or like, you know, like the idea of this. I think I'm going to draw the line at English. <laughs> Go for Italian. I'll draw the line. But, but what, I'm sure, what I'm trying to say is that whenever you can, whenever you can, um, whenever you can spread the word of sobriety, right. whatever way you do it, you never know who's listening. And it's all about planting seeds. And along the way in my journey in sobriety, I know I've planted seeds that have grown and that have gotten strong. And that's the thing. It's giving back. And, and you know, the first time we, we message each other, I wrote, to you, this is awesome what you guys are doing. You're being a service. Being it's a service. Awesome. And I remember that was the first thing that you caught. And then it's just... Because being of service in the uh, general public of society, people won't understand right. the lingo. Right. Être en service, être au service. But in, in the recovery world, like yeah. as soon as you, you tell someone, hey, thanks for being at service, we understand right. the power of this fellowship that you're describing, this like the surroundings that you were talking about, our entourage, so important. Everything that you've said is like nail on exactly what we need to do. Then to actually do it, that's a different topic, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of like misconception about addiction, recovery. Uh, you guys have a lot of time. So Jean-Claude, 30 plus years, 30 years, uh, 20 years. What are the biggest misconceptions? Some people are afraid. Some people are afraid of AA. Some people are afraid of recovery. Some people might say, yeah, but yeah, this is all fun and games, but I'm scared I won't have any more fun. You know, there's so many misconceptions. What are the biggest ones? I'd like to, to hear all of you. Jacques-Claude, let's start with Jacques-Claude because we haven't heard him a lot. That it's going to be easy fast. I think that's the biggest misconception. Like I always say, it took me like 10, 15, 20 years of active addiction and buffon and like, I can't cure that in three months. You can't? No, and I know <laughs> why. Because if I could, on the three months and one day, I would go back to where I was knowing that all I have to do is stop another time for three months and I'll be cured. That's, that's how that's sick I am. Yeah. I know my disease will tell me that. So I like what you were saying, that it's an everyday job and some days are easier, better. It just takes time. Jason, what are the biggest misconceptions? I think for me, the biggest misconception that people perceive is that um, it's a religious program. Um, mm. It's not a religious program. It's a spiritual program. And I think the thing that I love the most about the program I'm in, Alcoholics Anonymous, is that early on, these people got together and said, pick a higher power as you understand him. 
It doesn't it have to be any kind of higher power that it can be whatever you want it to be. And what I finally understood, and it took me probably 27, 28 years to understand God, what God really is. To me, God, the whole exercise of believing in God is ego deflation. It's trusting that you got to believe in something that you don't see, you don't understand, but you just have to have blind faith. And if you can do that, then you're out of your head. And that's ego. And I find the people that have the biggest egos are the ones that can't grasp that. That's the cop out. Oh, I don't do the God thing. Dude, no one's asking you to pick God. It doesn't have to be, you know, the God you saw in church. It can be whatever you want it to be. And they say it right there. Anything you want it to be, but just do it. And they can't do that. And I'm like, hey, man, that's all I've got to do. That's the biggest stumbling block. Pfft, hey, I don't care. You know, God can look like the God in the Monty Python movies. He can look like the God that I see in church. He can look like George Burns <laughs> from the Oh God. It doesn't matter. Uh, one of my buddies in California, who, a really good friend of mine, Sonny Mayo, who I'd love to have on this podcast one day, super, super spiritual guy. He's a big dog lover. And he said, he was having a hard time with the idea of uh, the concept of, of, of God. And they said, hey, God, it's dog backwards. And he's like, oh, I love dogs. My God's dogs. I see God through dogs. And then it was like, makes sense. So, yeah, I think the biggest misconception for me is that um, it's a religious program. It's not. It's a spiritual program. I love yeah. that. Uh, Rick, come on, tell us what are the biggest misconceptions. Well, first, I have, I have to um, agree with uh, Jason 100%. I, I my life is my girlfriend, my, 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 my kids who are grown out of the house, and my dogs. Yeah. <laughs> you know that, huh? How many dogs do you have? Right now, I got two. Yeah. I used to have three. Yeah. Now I got yeah. two. But the um, biggest to me is that, um, that if you're an alcoholic, then you're a loser, and, and that you deserve to be in the, the sous-sol in église, you know, with the uh, rabineux, puis, uh, puis the, the, the losers of society, which is so not true. I met people in A, and I'm not blowing an animal, uh, at, uh, I met judges, I met the, I met the construction workers, I met uh, uh, big bosses of big enterprises in the meetings, you know, no, 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 you're not a loser at all, because, an addiction, you know, is, is, is everywhere. Addictions are everywhere, you know. If you're addicted to alcohol, okay, you're addicted to alcohol, but don't feel judged by other that know because there's other people that are addicted to other stuff. They don't even know it, you know. Some people are addicted to porn, you know. They, they, it, seems, it seems like it's, it's like so, oh, it's nothing, you know. No, no, it, it is something because you got a wife, you know. She needs your love. She needs your attention. She needs to feel beautiful. If you're addicted to porn, she loses all of that, you know. Plus and, your time, that it's time consuming, no matter what addiction you have. It's going to take all that, you know. Exactly. It's only an addiction. You're not a loser because you're addicted to something. You're, you're a loser if you're addicted to something and you don't do anything about it. Then you lose on every point. You lose your life. You lose yourself. To, there's a phrase that goes, your addiction is as big as your lies about it. As, as, as much as you lie about your addiction... En français, ça se dit, ta maladie est aussi grosse que tes cachettes. Mm. Hein? You're only as sick as your secrets. Yeah. So the more you hide stuff, the more you hide stuff, the more you hide yourself. The more you are, and then, then it's somebody else that emerges because you got the cachette, you know? So to be, to, so the mess comes, I feel th this is it. But sometimes when I go to a meeting and I'm asked, speak for 45 minutes you know i go i'm sure a lot of you guys feel like losers well you're not you know just think about what i'm going to say right now all the bars around here they're all full full of people who are searching for their life or their meaning in life and and you know what all the meetings around here are full too so you've just decided in which gang you want it to be mm -hmm. you're a loser <laughs> I love that. Yeah, you just have to pick and choose. It's one decision. Which one you want to be? You want to be, you want to be in the bar spending your money, spending your money, spending your money, or you want to? And you know, and people, 
sometimes think, ah, oh, it's a cult, you know? No, no, yeah. a cult, you have to pay money to be in yeah, a cult. Yeah, it doesn't cost hey, anything. Hey, if you go to a meeting and you're broken and some they pass, you know, when it's time to, to la collect, yeah. it's to pay for the coffee, it's to pay for the sal, and they say, and they say it. And if you don't have money, don't, don't put any it. in. Yeah, no, don't worry about Please, it. Please, we'll, we'll cover you. Yeah, there's no obligations. You don't have to talk. You don't have to do anything. It's the desire. Yeah. Well, to, one, another misconception that the coffee is going to be good. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's, it's never good. good. <laughs> it's never good. Yeah. I'm sorry. The coffee yeah. here is amazing. This yeah. is but, coffee. But this the coffee, at, of course, I've it's never, good. I've it's never Candace Walls exactly. Coffee. But I've never had a good cup of coffee in an AME. I'm sorry. But mm. a lot sorry. of good, a lot of good conversations. Yes. So. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yep. <laughs> uh, we're coming to this uh, the the end of this podcast, and it feels like we just started. But uh, looking back on your journey and those twenty plus years, what is the one thing that you're the most proud of? That's the perfect question to go towards the end. It's the fact that uh, I call my my kids. En français, je les appelle des enfants. Or it's the fact that I'm gonna choke up. Yeah. Because having a, a house where your children are, are raised under an AA member means that there won't be screens, there won't be a loss of money, there won't be dishonesty, there won't be um, mayhem, non main vey. It's going to be a house where peace will be, will be. That's what I'm most proud of. It's, I stopped right at the perfect time. You know, I was 40 years old. My son was 10, my, my daughter was 12. They were going into puberty, you know? And, and they say, une, une, une fille, une fille se, se valorise à travers les yeux de son père. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Fait que, imagine if I would have left myself die from alcoholism because that's what would have happened if I wouldn't have joined AA and stopped drinking. Then that's what I would have left as a, an heritage to my kids, you know, that, 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 a lot of people had, have lived through that. I know because I've been in, for, in the movement for 20 years. So I, I had people come to me and say, my dad died from alcoholism. I watch him in his bed, you know, spewing blood. And those people said, so how did it make you feel? It made me feel that I, I didn't love him enough for him to cure himself. And I would go, no, 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 that's not what it is. No, that's, what I, that, that's how I feel, you know? So that's what I'm most proud of. That, so that you're most proud fun. of your legacy, which is your kids, and the fact that you were able to raise them in that environment, in the fellowship, in the ape, the principles. That's yes. what you're the most proud of. Yes, because without the movement, it, I, I would just have stopped drinking. I would have stayed the same. You know that that that, that I I have I own the decision and I'm the boss and I'm this. But 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 when you're in the fraternity, you, you've you've thought. You've thought That, that, it, that it's a democracy, your home, as much as, as when you're in life, you know? I don't know. I'm, I, I was raised by parents that are Italian, so I kind of relate with, to you. And yeah, it changed my perspective on what's a family. Like in my dad's conception, sort of your kids are your byproduct. Like I own you. You basically, I made you, I could destroy you. <laughs> so yeah, I, I really connect when you say this is more of a democracy. Yeah. You got to be able to respect others. Yeah. Uh, honesty, all these, these spiritual principle I've learned through AA because I, I, I'm broken too. Yes. I, I often say to my uh, future wife, I'm completely dysfunctional. Like it's not my fault. This is how I was raised. I am dysfunctional. A parent's job is not to tell their kids what to do. It's to help them grow. Right. right? How can you help somebody grow if you don't do any personal growth? Right? So this, it really hits home. And I know that I'm in the right path because I, I stopped using my daughter was three. My son is three years old uh, this month and he's never, because he was born and I was already in recovery. That's the one thing that I'm the most yeah, proud of. Yeah, same. And that's what I have to remind same. myself because they, they'll never have to experience that for me. But I got to be able to accept that maybe their path will be different. Mm. See, that's also a difference is I cannot start Uh, being a preacher, telling them this is Brad, alcohol is wrong, oh. drugs. That will like that's not my job. God's got a plan for them. God, God had a plan for me. But but you know it, it was terrifying for me when my kids got to 
uh, high school because I was sure that um, I was terrified. I was like, because by the time I was 14, 15, I was so well on my way. And when my son graduated from high school, he said to me, he goes, dad, I just want to tell you something. I said, what? He goes, you asked me not to drink and do drugs in high school if I could avoid it. He goes, I just want to let you know that I did because I didn't do anything because I didn't do anything in high school. And I, and I just want to tell you that. I go, okay, so is that going to continue in C-Shop? He goes, I can't guarantee that. <laughs> but, but was my, that because you never preached? I, I just, I really spoke to my kids honestly. Like I told them the truth. Like when my kids would ask me any question about my past, I wouldn't lie to them. I told them I did cocaine. I told them I did all kinds of drugs. I didn't lie to them. I didn't go like, no, no, no. Like, no, I told them all, all like the stories, warts and all, all the bad stuff because I want to be open with them and honest. And yes, they're, I think my kids are kind of a byproduct of growing up in an, in, in an AA home. Um, they've been to meetings. They've seen me take my cakes, but they're not interested. They're just not interested. They're like, why would I do that? It's dumb. I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> like, yeah, You're no. way I mean, smarter than I was. I know. Then. <laughs> like, wow. But then again, I didn't have the same kind of structure that they did when I was growing up. So it's also breaking the, the, the cycle of like, you know, but, you know, I really believe our parents do the best they can. You know, they, I don't think they're, they're, they're out to hurt. Like, they, I think they're just doing the best they can, like anybody is. But it's really gratifying when you see your kids grow up and you're like, man, like you're, you're able to make these decisions on your own and responsible decisions. So, um, but it's terrifying when your kids get older. It's terrifying. So when they grow up and they don't have to have that as an example, it's, uh, I think it's one extra, you know, bar in the column or one extra like you know point on the side of them being okay like at least they're not going to see that in their house you know Beautiful. so true you know if if you're suffering because you 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 inflict yourself suffering then you pass it on to your kids that's a no-brainer so when does that suffering stop it is when you stop suffering you know yeah. how do you stop suffering well find it out find out how there's a way to stop suffering. If you're suffering from anything, from any addiction, there's a way to stop it. Find a there way. There are solutions. Yes. And that's what's amazing. Uh, to end this podcast on a beautiful note, I'd like to hear, Rick, uh, what message would you like to share with others who are struggling? Somebody um, that's struggling right now. I would say... Um, you got just one life to live. This ain't this ain't dress rehearsal. This is the real stuff, you know. And um, if you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for your kids. Because uh, if if you're suffering right now and 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 you don't have no reason that find a reason, your dog, your kids, your mom, your dad. Because if you do, and you stay sober for a, quite a good period, then it's going to change. It's going to evolve into, you're going to do it for yourself. Then you're going to find true love, inner love. But, but there's a weight, you know? Sometimes people go, well, if you don't do it for yourself, it, it won't work. No, no, just, just try it any way you want. Any way you want. And keep on trying because relapsing is part of the... I think Jean Claude's got an opinion about relapse. <laughs> Tell me about relapsing, Jean Claude. It's not part, because a relapse, the 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 biggest misconception is that you're going to be able to come back. And staying in this program for long enough, I've been to funerals of people that I've went back to re went back using relapse, and it's pas grave. Le mois prochain, next month, I'll come back. Yeah, that's and one thing that's scary, especially when you know the program and you mm -hmm. think to yourself, mm -hmm. yeah, I did it one time, I'll be able to do it again. But that Like you're that, sure of how it starts, yeah. you're never sure of how it ends. And I'm not willing to take a gamble. But if you relapse and you want to come back, I'll be the first one to welcome you. I'm a relapser. Like uh, my first year was hell. So I know the process, but it's by just saying it's part of the program, it like okays a relapse and that's where I have a problem with it. Yeah. You know? No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I totally agree with you. So, so. But if it's part of your path, fine, but come back. Exactly. Don't be hard on yourself. You just, no. just be hard on the disease. Yeah. Be hard on it. This is the. And use it as a, a tool uh, to learn that, okay, I got fucked once again. You know, I thought this time or this way was good. 
No. Okay. I'm learn from that and I'll try it. I'm, uh, I'm really mind blown by this conversation. Uh, it was really, truly inspiring. First time I hear Jean-Claude swear, I that's know. also very crazy. <laughs> Dropping F-bombs. We're going uh, to edit end. that. No, we won't. And I'm, I'm actually trying to become, I'm on a process, I'm trying to become a better person, Rick, so. By not swearing? Uh, no, it's one so day I at a time. five huh? bucks to the generator, yes. is that it? Okay. Oh, I'm not participating in that. There's uh, not a chance. I will be broke. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. You're a truly inspiring man, and uh, I, um, I'm, I'm really glad I met you. Uh, it's going to definitely, definitely, this conversation definitely helped me, and it made me realize so many things. So thank you, Jason, for taking the time. 100%. As usual, Jean-Claude, you're the man. Fuck this. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> but, but before you say your, your classic line, we have to let people know, if you're suffering in your AA meeting with bad coffee, we've got a solution for you. <laughs> <laughs> you took my cue from before, just an uh, hour late. Check out our coffee, Grand Espoir. Um, it's awesome coffee, and uh, you can get more information on it at Rubino Shoes slash Grand Espoir. All the money raised, all the proceeds, go to help uh, battle recovery. And it's great coffee, so check it out. Beautiful. Don't worry, you'll get your, uh, your coffee. And we got something else for you. And uh, thanks again, uh, Rick. Guys, it's a wrap. <laughs>